Hands above your head. Go, oh! oh. Now, weirdly, I learned that at Ogilvy, and I've never lost a pitch doing that beforehand, so big tip to use that one. Um, I have lost pitches, I just forgot to do those. I think. Um, so I'm, trying, well, I'm going to talk to you, Si. You guys have been left out. You guys have got all of the, the chat. Um, and I've been asked to do four things in 15 minutes. Explain how you can improve healthcare in the workspace. Tell my own story and try and be inspiring. Uh, explain how AI can affect mental health. And what was the, oh, uh, explain how you create an ethical company that's structured to match the future. Like a really bad planner, I've decided to try and answer the brief and do all four things in 15 minutes, and, which means I'm going to speak pretty quickly. Um, but the good news is um, I used to be in advertising too. You don't need to be afraid. Um, I was a, I'm a trained geneticist and neurobiologist, and somehow I found myself at Ogilvy and Mather, where I met uh, Sarah, and everything she said is true. I then left as an arrogant young person and set up my own agency, which I then sold, and I worked at uh, Safe and Nitro. And I loved working in advertising. Lots of people leave advertising because they say, oh, I've got burnt out, or I didn't like it. I loved it. I loved the pitching, I loved the work hours, I loved the creativity, I liked working with people, um, I loved going out afterwards, I loved winning. I loved winning pitches, I worked really hard. And, uh, and so I literally didn't think I was going to do anything else with my life. I thought, this is great, I'll just keep doing agencies and, and grow. This is a picture of us at Eurobest with my, uh, one of my teams um, at Sapit Nitro. It was November, hence the uh, moustache. I don't quite know where the devil eyes came from. Um, and at this point in my life, I was living really fast. Like, I flew to Portugal, we won the award, I spoke to 500 odd people, I stayed up all night at a party, jumped on a plane, went to the social media awards in Wembley, spoke again, won again. I, I went to bed, I went to that party, woke up Saturday morning, and decided to go and run a charity run um, for, I can't remember, it was MS Trust, dressed as Santa Claus. And I decided I'll keep my moustache because it'll add a, an element of spice to my social media posts about me running as Santa. That ended up being a really bad idea because I decided to try and win the race. I was a living fast, I was a winner, I do things. Um, so I was running along, you know, I was in second, I could see the leader, and the, I have the memory of having like an awful headache, which then went away. Um, my wife tells me I came fourth in the race, and it's something that I'm still really annoyed about. But um, what was really interesting is I had no further memories until I woke up five days later at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I'd had a category five brain hemorrhage. Not recommended. Uh, category five is the biggest bleed you can have of the brain. I filled up my spinal column with blood. Um, I was in a coma. Um, I was told, my wife was told I was never gonna wake up. We'd been married six months and she was you know, signing pieces of paper um, about my organs. It's all kind of good things happened. Um, but unbelievably I woke up um, and no one understood why. I spent about two weeks trapped to this machine um, and uh, while well, they tried to work out why I wasn't dying um, and uh, why I wasn't getting any better. They then moved me to a different machine and uh, during that time I had five brain surgeries through my groin, which is uh, my wife's favourite uh, joke. Um, <laughs> and uh, and like, it was an amazing innovation. The National Hospital for Neuro Neurology and Neurosurgery were building a, an aerial that goes through your arteries and can do brain surgery from, it, from within your arteries, within your mind. Um, so I actually had two glued bungs in my brain, stopping any blood to my left visual cortex. Um, and there's a lovely moment, uh, again, I don't remember it, but my wife does, where you're asked to say, do you want this surgery? And I had a choice of, no, don't have the surgery and die, or yes, have the surgery, but you'll probably never see again, and you probably won't move very well. Um, and God knows whether it have any other effects, because you shouldn't glue your arteries shut. It's not a good idea. I'm, I'm not going to give you this, the, uh, the whole story of the hospital, but the good news is I woke up, and uh, I could lost half my eyesight, I lost a little bit of mobility, but, and I left the hostel about eight and a half stone, um, about two months later, and I went home and lived in a dark room for three months where my wife and my mother gave me sponge baths at 31, and uh, it really made me look at the world in a different way. Um, and, uh, and the kind of idea of getting back and you know, finishing the social media account for, um, for Labbrooks was less uh, exciting to me at the time. And, uh, and I actually drew, not this picture, but a version of it while I was in hospital, and I still have that kind of rather strange and disconnected diary. Um, rather than tell you what happened in the hospital, I'll tell you what I learned from it. And I learned two big things. The first thing I learned is this. Um, you only have a certain amount of energy in life, and when you're really ill, 
you know that you're very aware of how much you've got. I could stay awake for four hours a day. I could probably do one thing. And so you start being ruthless at investing your energy in only things that matter to you. And so I said, I'm going to invest. If I get through this, I'm going to invest my, money, my energy in keeping happy and healthy. Probably breaking Google screen. Sorry, Google. Um, I'm going to spend a third of my energy on the relationships that matter to me and a third of my energy doing something that is world changing. Because I realized if I was going to die, I didn't want to die just doing what I'd done to that day. And I still live by this every morning and evening. I spend some time thinking about, do I feel I've balanced my energy in this way? Um, but, um, and, uh, and, and at the time, I was obviously spending a lot of time in this space, and I try and kind of keep that balanced. That doesn't mean time. I don't spend a third of my time at the gym, a third of my time with my kids, and a third of my time at work. I spend more time at work than all those others, but um, I do really try and make sure I'm investing that wisely. The second thing I learned was the power of 1%. And as a planner, you should love this. Focus on something, measure it, and get better at it every single day. Um, so this was me in my first day of walking, post-surgery, fifth surgery. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing a nappy, great look going on, Guantanamo chic. Um, and uh, and uh, so I, I kind of started walking. I could walk about two meters when I left hospital. Um, and I couldn't be in a room with lights because I had migraine head pain. I lost all my right peripheral vision. So I did two things. I said, every day I'm going to get better I'm gonna, visually. I'm going to work on my visual cognition because I had the massive benefit of being a neurobiologist. So I knew loads about it. I'm, in fact, the only person at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery who asked for the screens to be moved around so that while I was lying awake during my surgery, I could watch my own brain surgery, um, which I'm still proud of. Um, it's weird. Um, then, um, and so, I, so each day I started with visual stuff, and I started doing kids' puzzles. And it was exhausting. And every day I was like, I'm going to get 1% better at these kids' puzzles. I'm going to force myself to do it visually. And then the next day I would do something physical. I said, can I walk one meter? Can I walk two meters? Can I walk five meters? And basically I started that when I got home. And within a month I was doing kids' puzzles. Within six months I was doing 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzles um, every week. Um, I did the same physically. Within a month, I was walking to the other side of the house. Within six months, I was um, jogging around the garden. Within 16 months, I ran the London Marathon again. And within two and a bit years, I was running from London to Brighton doing ultra marathons. And I'm still going, so um, I, uh, you won't stop me. So power of 1%. So take those two things away. Oh, quick strip. Um, costume change. Um, and so obviously I wasn't very well when I left. And I decided I was going to create a business in neuropsychometrics, which I've now done, um, because I was really interested in measuring cognition. I had my brain measured in 75 dimensions by a very highly skilled team every six months so I could see how my cognition was changing. I said, this is amazing. Imagine if we could all do that. But I was too well. Um, I really wasn't very well at all, um, and, but I met two amazing people called Zareen and Anne-Marie. And Zareen and Anne-Marie are the founders of Just Giving, and they took a massive punt on hiring a person who was pretty ill and on prescription painkillers um, to come and join them as their CMO and to try and turn around Just Giving. So, so, um, and so what I learned at Just Giving, does everyone know Just Giving? Okay, yeah, so I joined Just Giving, we were raising about 180 million a year, we were 5 million registered users, I was there for 5 years, and you know, we were raising half a billion pounds a year for charity by the time I left. Um, we had 24 million registered users in the UK. We had 80% of UK postcodes. Um, it was you know, an extraordinary journey, and we turned it around from a kind of loss-making organization that was failing to, um, to break even and growing very quickly and launching in different markets. But I'm not here to kind of brag about just giving. I'm here to say about learning about a different type of organization. They created a completely different culture. It was chaos, but it was interesting. Um, they, they, they were really kind of cared about how do we create a mission-driven organization. They thought about how do they structure the shareholding agreements, how do they um, structure their contracts. Every single element of that business was about the mission first and foremost and not necessarily about shareholder value. Which leads me on to HelloSelf. So HelloSelf is the new adventure. Doing all right. Um, uh, the new adventure has been a tough one. I left... Um, just giving oh, a couple of years ago now, and um, they did sell it. I was actually the CEO by the end of it, not just the COO, but never mind. Um, and, uh, and I had the kind of pleasure and uh, pain of selling a business that I thought I would work for for the rest of my life. Um, and so I decided what to do with this kind of newfound flexibility. And so I went back to what I learned in hospital. How can I help everyone understand and experience what it means to be your best self? How can I get, help every single person on this planet improve themselves? And so we came up with a four-step strategy, as you do, 15-year um, plan, as they like to say. 
the first thing was we were going to help people who were in a bad place. So we were going to launch the most trusted clinical therapy brand in the world so that people could get access to high quality clinical psychologists when they needed to. Because if anyone's been in therapy, it's horrible. Like finding the right therapist is dreadful. It's very expensive. No, like, am I talking to a clinical psych or a counseling psychologist or am I talking to a psychotherapist? There's so much confusing. It is a marketplace not designed with the user in mind. It's designed with the clinician in mind. And I thought, I, I'm a consumer person. I can do this. Not knowing anything about this world, I happened to very luckily uh, know some brilliant neuropsychometricians. I knew some brilliant therapists from the hospital. I had the AI team from Just Giving that I stole and brought with me, and then, um, and then I had kind of me in the middle. So we started off trying to build the UK's most trusted clinical therapy practice. We launched in January, with one member and one customer. We're now doing about 600 ses 650 sessions per month. We'll do 1,000 sessions per month in November, which puts us in the top five clinics in the country. Um, and uh, it's growing really fast, uh, really fast, too fast, in some, some might say. And then, so that's, and, and the great news is, you know, by December, we'll be delivering sort of 500 people and, get, and getting them through therapy and out of therapy and back to their um, better selves um, quite quickly. Step phase two of that was to create a uh, digital model of self. We want to read, and I've got some charts for this one in a second, but I'll do this one. We want to um, redefine psychology. So I'm like a biologist, and my kind of CTO is a big data scientist. And so we were like, how can we understand what makes you you? How can we understand you? And we decided to call that self. And so we started looking at constructs of self, you know, cognition data, personality data, emotion data, mental health um, kind of uh, tracking metrics, but also things like brain imaging data, lifestyle data, how much you run, how much you eat, when you breathe, where you are, all of this data we can take into one place and we can start looking for interesting patterns and correlations. So we call this our digital model of self and we kind of give this to our users and we help them understand themselves. I'll show you an example in a second, but for example, I found out caffeine in the afternoon makes me less happy for three days, so uh, on average, so that you start finding out interesting things about yourself from this data. The third phase was to use that massive data set to uh, build an AI life coach. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can you know, decide what, how, what and how you want to use your data. And then the fourth stage is to invest in brain technologies. So my biggest worry for the world, and specifically for advertising, is we are 15 years away from brain-computer interfaces. We are 15 years away from you being able to download your ads into your brain. Um, and I'm worried that you guys will love that before I'm ready for it. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, uh, and you know, Facebook and Google are spending hundreds of millions on it actually, every year. Um, and so I want to make sure that people can understand themselves before they start making proactive decisions. We don't want to be having fun all the time. We don't want to be you know, diverse, you know, distracted by stuff all the time. We have to be conscious about how we're building ourselves. So we did three things. We First of all, we set up a really interesting company structure. This is really dull, but very exciting. So we set it up as a B Corp Plus, as I call it. Um, so we did everything with all, all of our articles, all of our um, uh, kind of records, all of our contracts are all with the member at heart. We do not serve our shareholder at all, in fact. They are removed from it. It was interesting raising money with that, um, but we did. Um, but we've also done thing. We created, tried to create a culture around helping people be their best selves. We gave 10% of the business away to our members, so we're effectively 10% a co-op. So if you're giving your data to the platform, you're effectively an owner of the, uh, of the, of the platform. <coughs> And we're really trying to change all the time about how to create a different type of kind of corporation, a different type of capitalism. Because ultimately, we think we're going to be a kind of kite mark for the data of self. And so we need to be owned by our, our users. The second thing we started doing is looking at self data. So this is um, some of the data we look at. So this is me. So there's different kind of questionnaires we're doing. There's different emotion trackings that happen. Um, this is actually a kind of questionnaire that we kind of ask people to track in a number of different um, dimensions about different life stages and it starts giving me insights back again. This is really new for us but it's starting to unlock some really interesting scientific insights um, and by Christmas I think we'll probably have the biggest non-NHS data set of um, objective outcome measures um, to show how mental health interventions, lifestyle interventions are working for people's psychology. Um, and you know, this is um, the, the, the sort of extraordinary kind of breakthrough. Because we want to do three things. 
our algorithms will um, not only understand who you are, we call it self-diagnosis. We kind of diagnose who yourself, I don't know, I'm picking on you, I'm sorry. Self-diagnosis. So we create a model of you so we understand you. But also it's, we're using vector data so we can kind of understand what is the most likely outcome, projection over time of where you think yourself is going. Um, and so we can try and predict people entering either a stressed environment or an um, anxiety-led environment. And then we're also starting to match those outcomes um, with different interventions you could do. So it might be people who are really late in the, in the scheme who are already not that well need a kind of clinical psychologist. But what could we do when we're predicting, you know, like really early? How could we get people to exercise more or spend more time being social or to cut out some coffee in the afternoon or give up booze or whatever else it ends up being that the right thing for them to do? And how do we do that on a personalized level? Because yourself is different from yourself, which is different from yourself, which is different from yourself. And if everyone was the same, then we should treat everyone um, with one medical intervention, but it doesn't work. Your, yourself is not a broken arm. Your mental health issues are very unique. Oh, I hate very unique. Unique isn't, yeah, you can't be very unique. You get a, is an absolute. <laughs> Sarah will shout at me in my um, brief. So this is what we are today. We basically have clinical psychologists, um, which are available online through kind of booking of your sessions. We have your self profile where you can track certain parts of yourself. You have your support team like, and life coaches, etc. And people are starting to track mood. They're trying to track sort of um, their outcomes. They're starting to track what they do on a day to day basis. Um, and today we do that working with um, med med medical companies that refer to us, people who are not well. We also work directly to consumers, and we work with employers who um, what, you know, basically give um, HR teams to turn around and say, I want this person to be helped, and they can be assessed and in therapy within 20, um, 48 hours. So we're available anywhere and any time, um, and we're getting there slowly. I was asked to give you some advice, and I'm running over, so I apologize, but only a couple of minutes, which for me is rare. Um, <coughs> What would I do if I were you guys? I would do these three things. So think about 1% things. I think I, I actually really was inspired by what you guys were talking about because it is so actionable, it is so doable, um, and it will make a big difference. But the one thing I would urge all of you is to take your own responsibility for yourself. Like your agency is never going to be able to fix you. They are going to work you hard. Um, it's their business. Um, and so you need, to, you need to know you better than anyone else. So take some responsibility. So find out what makes you your best self. I don't know what it is. For me, it's you know, a bit my kids and running and, and uh, sleeping well. I sleep brilliantly. Um, and so, uh, thanks. Um, and, uh, I'll show you my Fitbit data. It's really special. Um, and, but you know, I decided what that is, and I've optimized it now, and I'm still optimizing it. And every morning, I think, about, what am I meant to be optimizing? What am I not optimizing? And it is genuinely crazy that in a creative world, we all sit at computers and screens and try and fill in a blank piece of paper with the most inspiring thinking you can do, when actually inspiration is around us in the world rather than at our desks. So you know, make this for yourself. Second of all, then fight for it for yourself within your agency. So take these things back that we, they, these guys have shared. Make them happen in your agency. But do things that are right for you. If you need flexible working, ask for flexible working. If you like, want to go to an art gallery at lunchtime, go to an art gallery at lunchtime. At Hello Self, we're not great at this, but we're working on it. People have infinite holidays. They can work when they don't, whenever they want. They can work wherever they want. But you know, we're getting a bit bigger, so how, how do we get collaboration in that way? How do you get teams to build cultures? It's, it's a challenge that we're all working for. We work on, like, we have a Thursday where everyone comes together and you have like, all of the group meeting-like things, and everything else is kind of ad hoc gathering. I will steal the uh, email one, though, because I'm dreadful at that. I uh, slack people whenever I've got an idea, which is not good. <laughs> and then the last thing, which we haven't talked about much today, is I think every single one of you people could do something extraordinary for society. And it could be big or it could be really small. And I actually believe that the kind of combination of small things will make a huge impact. So if you want, go and create a mission-driven organization that's using big data to change people's mental health uh, issues. Or you could just ask someone how they are each day. One of the worst and most inspiring parts of my job is I speak to a lot of ill people. So Bex um, took me to an event. Last week, when I spoke with 150 people who've been having suicidal thoughts and wanting to kill themselves, um, the one thing they asked us, they just wanted someone to ask how they were. Um, that was started a conversation. It's, it's literally can save lives. So just think about what the small things you can do every day. Because if all of us did 1% things every single day, I promise you, the world will be absolutely extraordinary very, very quickly. That's how it's off. <laughs> <laughs>